I am uh, excited to be here. This is part two of a three-part deep dive series. Uh, last month, we were talking about um, African-American women composers and thinking that this is November, um, some things hopefully to be, to be thankful for, uh, upcoming to uh, give thanks to some early, early pioneers. Uh, we were listening to George Bridge Tower, who is maybe a name you have heard, uh, and if not, uh, a composer as well as a, a child prodigy violinist. Most uh, associations of George Bridgetow are probably with uh, Beethoven, who is a name that you may have also heard as well. He's um, celebrating his 250th anniversary this year. Beethoven and George Bridgetow were friends uh, and eventually foes. Uh, and knowing a little bit about Beethoven, he had a very um, fickle temper, I guess. So it's easy to see how things could, could fall out of favor with him. But George Bridgetower was a, a fantastic violinist and one that Beethoven very much admired and wrote a sonata uh, for George Bridgetower. Their friendship be became uh, one of a foe uh, related over a, a sort of duel over a woman. Uh, and he ended up Beethoven dedicating that sonata that he wrote for George Bridgetower and premiered with George Bridgetower for another violinist, Kreitzer. Uh, so this sonata is uh, one that is um, well studied in, in a lot of uh, conservatories, the Kreitzer sonata, but it was originally written for George Bridgetower, who was the composer of that first piece. So I uh, want to go way, way back, actually about 500 years, uh, and try to work our way up through the early 1900s of some really amazing uh, stories and figures and composers, as well as musicians who uh, really set a, a tone of artistry and excellence as it relates to classical music and African diasporic um, creators. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen just so that we can see some of these people that we are going to engage with. Right. <clears throat> and going quite, quite a ways back, I wanted to start in the early 1500s with a musician, actually, John Blanke. Uh, John Blanke is, uh, or was a trumpet player who was part of King Henry VII and King Henry VIII's uh, royal court. And it was actually a time when um, being a, a court musician was really highly regarded as a high, highly regarded servant. Uh, John Blanke, <clears throat> who probably came from North Africa, uh, a group of um, Black Muslims called Moors, ended up in uh, England and participating in uh, King Henry VII and King Henry, Henry VIII's court. Uh, he played on a uh, early, early version of a trumpet one that doesn't have any vowels for those that um, are familiar with our, our modern day trumpets. But he was given room and board. Uh, he was given actually a, a high, high salary at the time, which was about three times um, other, uh, three times earnings of what other servants would be given during his tenure. He um, commissioned successfully to uh, actually be um, awarded more funds for his service as a, a member of this uh, prestigious royal court uh, and was able to earn uh, additional funds and during, during his time as well. I, I reference him not because he is a, a composer, but I reference him because he's one of the first examples, if not the first examples, of Black artistry in what we consider Western classical music, dating back to the early 1500s. This particular image that we're seeing here is from a uh, large scroll that was depicting a whole celebration of, of events. The trumpet players, John Blanke being in the middle here, um, would play at various royal festivities, would play at celebrations, birthday parties, would play at um, sporting events, which is all depicted in this scroll that extends 60 feet, if not longer. Um, and he appears a, a few times, I think twice actually, in this, in this scroll. And again, it's the first representation, this dating from 1511, that we have of Black excellence, contribution, performance and engagement in um, 
classical music. In thinking about some of the creators in uh, what we consider Western classical music, there's probably a name if you were to, to search um, early, early Black composers that would pop up, and that's Ignatius Sancho, uh, who is pictured here from the uh, 1700s. Even prior to Ignatius Sancho, Sancho about 200 years prior, is uh, Vicente Lusitano. Vicente Lusitano is an Afro-Portuguese uh, composer, uh, as well as theorist, and he wrote a treatise and like sort of um, a number of composers and creators that are in the arts had a little bit of a, of a dramatic um, life in, in the sense that he wanted to really share ideas as, as he felt were ones to promote in uh, music and had a little bit of a, of a debate or sort of a sparring match with another theorist who had um, other ideas as it relates to, to music. Uh, long story short, he ended up winning this particular duel of, of ideology um, and publishing his, his treaties um, around what he felt would be uh, sort of the future of music. Some things that he, that he really um, promoted were uh, chromatic. So if you think of um, piano going up sort of step by step from uh, one particular note to uh, the, the next particular note, but very incremental. Uh, and we'll actually listen to uh, one of his earliest pieces that, that we have uh, to be able to hear this uh, stepwise um, ascension. Like other composers uh, at his time, being in the 1500s as well, not long after John Blank, uh, he wrote a lot of music to be sung. So he had a lot of motets, he had various choral works, he had things that um, were madrigals, but all things that were to be sung. We um, don't necessarily credit him as being the first African descent person to, to uh, have published. Uh, more, more often than not, Ignatius Sancho, again, 200 years later, is um, credited as being the first African descended person to, to be published. But I, I go back to Vicente Lusitano, Afro-Portuguese, to be published, whose work we still have. Um, Ignatius Sancho, who again is pictured here, uh, has a really interesting story in the sense that he was most likely born en route. And when we think about this particular time period, uh, the mid-Atlantic slave trade en route uh, to England from, from Africa. Uh, he did not know his, his parents. He did not know his, his father, certainly. Uh, and when he arrived in England, he was taken in by a, a family of sisters, actually. Uh, and by taking in, uh, he became a, a servant of theirs. They um, treated him as typical of, of the time as being an exotic figure, dressing him in ways that were what they thought very African. Um, they acknowledged that he had aptitude for music, but very much uh, there is documentation that, that didn't go beyond their acknowledgement because providing that sort of education or education period to an enslaved person would be um, far too dangerous. So they, they acknowledge that he has musical aptitude and it was a, a neighbor sort of down the street where uh, he was able to find solace and actually engage in some musical studies. Uh, he ended up leaving this family of sisters uh, who had purchased him to, um, this sort of neighbor down the street who was able to uh, not only shepherd him and take care of him, but provide um, studies, opportunities, as well as um, funding when, when she passed. She um, gave him funding in her uh, uh, offering when, when she had passed so that Ignacio Sancho had some sort of endowment to be able to uh, create a future and a life for himself. One thing that he ended up doing was to create his own uh, storefront. Ironically, at the time, uh, typical at the time, but also ironic because he is African descended, uh, he created a storefront that sold uh, tobacco, that sold sugar, um, that, that sold products that were very much entrenched in the slave trade system. Again, typical at the time uh, since 
the slave trade system in all sorts of facets as it relates to economics and politics and all sorts of things just was really pervasive in all, all manners of life. But by having his own business, he was in England able to uh, be eligible to vote. Uh, so he became the first African descended person in England to cast his own vote. His storefront was one that was really a hub for ideas, for people to come and discuss, uh, to talk about music as he was musically inclined as well. Uh, his son eventually took over that uh, same storefront and created a uh, bookstore, being the first African descendant person to have a bookstore um, in, in England. During Ignacio's um, time uh, in this particular space, again, really using it as a way to um, act as a, as a meeting space, as a meeting house, a gathering space, he was able to uh, publish his theory of music, um, similar to our, our Vicente Lusitano, his own sort of ideas as it relates to music, his own treaties, uh, a set of songs. And we have some of these songs, which are really uh, melodies that could be performed for any instrument that could be sort of arranged for any instrument that could be um, improvised, for instance, um, as well as dances and some, some other plays. He was also a man of letters and wrote uh, a number of, of letters. So we have, from his perspective, really documentation bird's eye view. Is that correct? No, worm's eye view very much on the ground of what his life was like and also what the community was like during his, during his time period. Um, both, of these, both of these people really represent our, our sort of first documentation as it relates to, to music, as it relates to music treaties, as it relates to um, music compositions, um, and as it relates to some of the sort of musical ideas at the time period, granted separated by 200 years uh, as well as in two different countries, but some of our first, as we have in the African diaspora, um, African diaspora publishers um, in this in this field. So I would I would love to share a little bit of audio, uh, and it's a brief audio, and would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, and I'm going to share a piece by Vicente Lusitano, his Hoyme Domine, um, and again would love to hear your thoughts. Minding you that this was written about 500 years ago, thinking about some of the music that we may engage with today, does this sound like something that was written 500 years ago? Um, does it does it evoke anything for you? Do you like it, for instance? Uh, this particular piece, I'll share a little bit more about afterwards, but would love to hear your initial thoughts. Before we, before we continue, um, dropping any comments in the chat from what we just heard, 
again, thinking that this was written in the early 1500s, does it, does it sound like music you might have heard from the early 1500s? Does it sound like music you might hear today? Um, any, any thoughts and reactions? I would, I would love to hear from you and I can help fill you in a little bit more about what this piece uh, was about. From Philomena, lovely is this Latin, so he, uh, humo damine, H-E-U-M-E damine, um, is, is Latin and it is one that, in, in terms of the translation of the text, is asking for, um, on, on one's deathbed, asking to be, to be um, removed from this pain, I am a sinner, Remove me from this pain and and take me into uh, into your world, O oh, oh Lord. Uh, so it's one that is very much um, tinged, as, as we can hopefully hear in this music, with uh, pain as it relates to end of life, and also this very slow upward ascension from all of these again chromatic intervals, step by step ascension, as we perhaps make this slow rise up to to heaven. Um, Sheila says it sounds timeless, Gregorian chants, I've heard all my life. Very much, again, related to the, the vocal music that you would have during this time. One that is religious, such as Gregorian chants. One that is uh, sung with a very pure tone. You can imagine in a, a huge cathedral or in a huge, really resonant space, feeling um, the presence of, of the Lord, feeling the presence of someone's soul sort of ascending to to heaven so it really plays on this space and on the music um, of the time what it was used for and also how it would have been uh, resonated inside of us um, Rachel music ed students definitely sounds like renaissance uh, we've never learned about black composers in the fields um, like this at the time uh, and it's amazing to to learn about uh, there is more chromaticism than others during this time. So and as a question, I, I'm not 100% sure. So Vicente um, Lusitano really advocated for chromaticism. There were other composers at the time who really advocated for microtonalism, which is even, even in between our little half steps, we have littler steps. Um, and we find a lot of that microtonalism um, really dividing our, our notes very, very small in a lot of um, Middle Eastern music, for instance, and a lot of contemporary music, actually, I should say, um, now as well. But there were definitely different camps about trying to uh, avoid certain intervals uh, and really highlight other intervals. Uh, and he was very much a part of trying to use chromaticism and trying to use uh, um, sort of the white keys on, on, on the piano uh, in what's it's known as a diatonic scale system. Uh, I would be happy to share links to both this recording afterwards. I think I can probably pass that on to Helen who can share. I, I think I gave our, the slide uh, deck from our part one deep dive and I'm happy to do that again with some of the hyper, um, some of the hyperlinks. So Vicente Lusitano, earliest, by, by my records, Afro-Portuguese uh, composer, publisher, 200 years before Ignacio Sancho, who again is a, is a name that is more often than not credited with being the first African descended uh, publisher and therefore sort of putting our presence on the map as it relates to what we consider Western classical music. I'm going to jump around now to a personal favorite composer of mine, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, um, and jumping, I, I mean jumping um, some centuries. So we were sort of sticking in the 1500s with Vicente Lusitano and then uh, with Ignacio Sancho in, in the 1700s, uh, early 1700s, and we come to now Samuel Coleridge Taylor, also in England. Samuel Coleridge Taylor, um, I also have a musical example to share with you, and again, would love to hear your thoughts. But Samuel Coleridge Taylor uh, was a um, young composer who was very, from an early age, engaged and very curious about music. So uh, similar to Ignacio Sancho, taught himself a lot, taught himself with, with reading, taught himself with music. There was a, a story of him sort of 
saving up his earnings to buy a piano. And a piano really was just a box with some strings on it to, for, for him to sort of explore and engage. Very interested in singing as well. His first teacher was his grandfather, who he grew up with. Uh, and his grandfather really created a warm, familial space where he could, uh, Samuel Courage Taylor, explore and um, have resources and the, the um, support that he needed to be able to engage. So um, he, he grew up, one, in a, a, in a space where he was able to really um, feel fostered, I would say. And it was in, I believe, a church community setting where someone said, you know, you, you really should study um, music. You really should pursue this and offered suggestions about actually where he could study. And that suggestion was the Royal College of Music. He entered the Royal College of Music when he was 15. Um, I think 15 and one month he had just uh, turned by the time he entered uh, in 1890 to the Royal College of Music to study violin at the time. Um, he was one of the first black students at that college. There had been um, a handful of others prior to him, but he's really part of the first to really enter into, into this school. Um, and I'd like to share that at the time that he entered, again, 1890, the cost of tuition was 40 pounds, which is the equivalent of about 50 US dollars. And I'm not sure with inflation after many centuries how much that would be, but I share that in thinking, wow, that's, that's amazing <laughs> to have certainly so much support and to have a resource um, such as the Royal College of Music. Um, at the time, he was also part of a class, some other English names that you may know um, if you're a, a classical music fan, uh, Rolf von Williams, as well as um, Gustav Holst. And there's accounts of, as a music student, performing your composition with the student orchestra and Gustav Holst, I think was playing trombone in one of Samuel Courage Taylor's pieces and uh, Vaughn Williams was playing triangle in one of, one of his sort of student pieces during his time there. Um, but he entered as a violinist and was very much engaged with a lot of the other um, sort of music departments being very omnivorous. Uh, and eventually he um, took to composition, studying composition at, at Royal College of Music. One of his professors had challenged all, all of the students to create a work that would rival the Brahms clarinet quintet. Um, and if you don't know the uh, clarinet quintet by Brahms, I would suggest uh, definitely listening to it. And then um, Samuel Courge Taylor took took this very much to heart and created his own very beautiful monstrous 35 minute uh, clarinet quintet which for me is is one of my all-time favorite pieces I, I won't be playing that one specifically tonight but would very much highly encourage you to check uh, check this out there's some recordings on on youtube at the college he did pick up um clarinet as as well as some other instruments and really engaged in a lot of uh, neo-romantic writing. During this same time too, he was also very much engaged with a feeling of pan-Africanism, which is really a, a shared solidarity and shared sentiment as African descended peoples. He um, helped organize a pan-African conference in, in London with uh, Paul uh, Lawrence Dunbar, a famous uh, poet and spent some time also um, in, as an audience member with the Fiske Jubilee singers who had uh, come to England on tour and was blown away by African-American spirituals, was really struck with the, um, again, this, this shared solidarity as black peoples of what spirituals were referencing with hopes of freedom and um, shared solidarity. He also went to the States and um, was really seen as a, a icon of someone who could rise, someone who, who is, is Black could really rise in stature <clears throat> and be celebrated. Uh, there was, in, in the early 1900s, um, Samuel Courge Taylor Society, a, a vocal society, a vocal group in Washington, D.C. that was formed. Um, Samuel Courge Taylor was quite literally seen as being 
a, um, a celebrity and visited the White House um, and had multiple performances during his time in the States, but was really one who helped advocate and um, present in highly, highly composed um, concert pieces for solo piano, for orchestra, for choral, for ensemble, um, that really infused African-American spirituals and idioms into, into his music. Uh, the piece that I do want to play and would, would again love your thoughts on this is one of his most celebrated pieces called the Hiawatha. And it's actually in, in, in three parts and we'll just hear one small movement. Um, and this, this piece is a huge choral work with orchestra, various soloists, and it is based on um, a poem and the poem, just to give a little bit of a context, um, is one that in, in a similar vein with uh, struggle and um, oppression and trying to find freedom with the indigenous communities in, in, in the States, um, very much took to this uh, story, which is um, very grounded in Native American and, African, and, and, and indigenous um, uh, themes. <clears throat> um, with this particular work, he was able to um, present it in such a way that was highly received during his time. It was um, one that would be performed as often as uh, Han uh, uh, Handel's Messiah, as Mendelssohn's Elijah, one that was performed um, over 200 times, I believe, in the span of two or three years in England alone. Uh, and certainly one that would travel with him and be performed quite often in the States. So I want to share just a little bit of this and again, hear your thoughts. Strawberries, when 
While you're, you're putting in your thoughts in the chat, I'll share a little bit more about this piece. So um, it was inspired, as I said, by a poem, and the poet was Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the poem of the same name, Hiawatha, that was written in 1855. And it talks about Hiawatha's um, community that was um, colonized by Europeans who uh, converted them to, to Christianity. Sam and Gorge Taylor very much felt um, kinship with this story, certainly one who um, also was a promoter of Pan-Africanism, this shared solidarity as African descended peoples with colonization, with livelihood, with um, ideals that were um, forced upon, and very much took, took heart to this, uh, to this particular piece and really spoke to the life uh, and story of Hiawatha. Uh, he named his child Hiawatha, uh, he would sign his, his letters to his wife um, as Hiawatha. Some of, some of it may be um, uh, over, over the top with his enthusiasm, but he very much really um, felt kinship with this particular story. Um, I have a few things that are coming in the chat. So from Joel, hearing more of Sam McCord Taylor's music on classical radio stations. It is, for me, it's um, so comforting and so beautiful and so um, indulgent to play as well as indulgent to listen to. And I am a very indulgent person, so it speaks um, to, to me. From Rachel, that it sounds like an old movie uh, soundtrack, so flowing and beautiful, like a whoosh of sound. Uh, and I could, I could certainly see as I think typical of this particular time period, if we think of, um, again, who I mentioned on Williams, Holst, um, other romantic uh, composers, Brahms, thinking that there's narratives, that there's stories that are um, sometimes extra musical that's being added, such as this one about Hiawatha that's being added to, to the sound uh, that we're hearing. So very much in, in my mind, being able to see uh, some sort of moving narrative, some sort of film or a dance performance or some, something visual, uh, I think is 
definitely, definitely true and characteristic of a lot of this music that is trying to invoke different um, imagery. Um, like an old Nelson Eddy video. This, this one, I'm, I'm ashamed to say, I don't know. Um, but perhaps uh, if that resonates with you, um, I think again, all, all the more reason to, to stick with it, um, trying to find connectivity with any of this music that, that we are talking about in these deep dive series, I think is, is most important. Um, Samuel Gorge Taylor uh, was, was one, as I shared, who very much promoted African-American spirituals. He has um, over 80 compositions. And just to read some of the titles, Symphonic Variations on an African Air, Bambula, which is based on a West Indi Indian dance melody. Um, he has uh, a number of other works, his 24 uh, Negro melodies, which are for piano and have been arranged for all sorts of different um, instrumentations. Very much took it upon himself to, again, promote and elevate uh, with his, his unique and very beautiful voice, African-American um, spirituals as well as uh, a lot of traditions. He, he says of this sort of um, charge that he, that he took upon himself, what Brahms has done for the Hungarian folk music, Dvorak for the Bohemian, and Grieg for the Norwegian, I have tried to do for Negro melodies. And again, feeling that um, these other composers that he had referenced really is trying to elevate folk songs, folk melodies, being ones that are from uh, melodies from the people, really trying to do the same with African American spirituals, melodies and um, uh, music from African American people. Uh, were white audiences in the US receptive of his work in the North and in the South? So Samuel Courage Taylor, I'm, I'm not sure with the, the divide of North and South, uh, I had referenced in Washington, DC, um, he was he led, he conducted uh, a full white orchestra in the Washington, uh, DC area. Um, I don't know where you would position that with various things with North and South, um, especially as uh, the North, certainly in this, in this early 1900s, thinking of great migration, six million black people going to Chicago and Harlem and things like this, um, still had still had its issues. But in any, any case, um, he was uh, able to conduct this all white orchestra. Uh, he was able to visit the White House, as I had mentioned um, earlier, uh, and seen certainly within the black community as uh, an emblem of hope, especially thinking about post reconstruction and Jim Crow laws and various um, reincarnations of, of oppressive laws, um, both uh, laws by the books and also laws from uh, uh, sort of individual um, individual communities that weren't necessarily um, written in stone, but ones that were practiced, I guess I, sh I should say. But he very much uh, was, was again seen and heralded as a, an icon within the Black community. And again, very celebrated in uh, an a interracial community uh, in England. Um, I, I will share too, as I, as I had already mentioned, this particular um, piece comes from his Hiawatha three-part choral work. Really, he, he received, as I, as I shared, high, high airtime rivaling Handel, rivaling uh, Mendelssohn up until the war, uh, and I believe World War I, if I'm having my information correct here. Uh, and there was generally, after that, a sort of anti-American sentiment and African-American spirituals, which is, again, something that he heralded, was certainly seen as being uh, very uh, American at the time when, when thinking about in, in Europe and other places. Um, so it, his music became um, less performed with its really direct associations with American culture, African American specifically. Uh, and then as, as Joel, I think, had shared that there's a, a sort of resurgency on, on some of the radio stations and conversations now when thinking about music of black composers, not specifically African American, but again, from the entire diaspora, uh, who, whose music, certainly during a pandemic, when we're socially distanced, um, can, can we share? Uh, so hearing his music um, now uh, on, on radio stations and in modern times may be a name that you may come across as well too. All right, so in thinking about uh, early pioneers, 
I very much wanted to give credit to some of the people that documented some of these early pioneers, both of whom have Boston roots. So uh, James Monroe Trotter, who was uh, born an enslaved, <coughs> sorry, an enslaved person, uh, was one who was not necessarily uh, a, a trained musicologist, but one who took it upon himself to really document and create this sort of um, uh, Rolodex, a uh, huge anthology of musical people and um, it, it, as it relates to Boston, as it relates to other sort of hotbeds around the, uh, around the country. It was published in Boston, Boston um, Publisher, in 1878 and uh, is one that is filled with just so many stories, so many names, names that um, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, names that are really only referenced, I think, in his in his book, but is really, you know, this this person enjoys making music. This person has performed at these various um, spaces that no longer exist. It's really a a highly detailed description of a particular time and time and place. Uh, I wanted to to read the full title because I think the full title really showcases everything that's in this book as well as the foreword I would like to read for you for his, for his reasoning why he wanted to create this. So the full title, again published in 1878 in Boston, is called Music and Some Highly Musical People, containing brief chapters on, one, a description of music, two, the music of nature, three, a glance at the history of music, four, the power, beauty, and uses of music, following which are given sketches of the lives of remarkable musicians of the colored race with portraits and an appendix containing copies of music composed by colored men. That is the full title, but by short, music and some highly musical people. Um, I, I think it's um, a, a beautiful book that you can actually find on IMSLP, which is um, just a, a sort of open uh, music. And um, in this case, this anthology that is in, um, not not no longer in copyright so you're able to find this on inslp.org music and some highly musical people and just sort of sift through of who's whose list during this particular time again in boston and other other places of who is making music from the forward of this book i'll share as i, I really think it hits home to why he wrote this and also why it's also an important uh, document that we still have in the hope then of contributing to the formation of a more just opinion of black people, of including a cheerful admission of its, meaning the artistic capabilities of black people, um, of, of that existence, and of aiding to establish between both race, races relations of mutual respect and good feeling, of inspiring the people most concerned, if that be necessary, with a great pride in their own achievements and confidence in their own resources as a basis for other and even greater acquirements as a landmark, a particular guide for a future and better chronicle. Finally, as a sincere tribute to the winning power, the noble beauty of music, a contemplation of whose own divine harmony should ever serve to promote harmony between man and man. In these purposes in view, this humble volume is fully issued. Very much wanting to promote um, pride within the Black community, very much wanting to promote, um, again, a, a, a undisputed list of names and achievements and accomplishments for those of, of multiple races to be able to uh, see that, yes, as Black people, um, there are very highly musical um, uh, creators and performers and contributors to this field. So it documents um, a a snapshot, one that is, again, specific to, to very various communities in a very particular time period, uh, thinking about reconstruction, post-reconstruction, and this elevation as Black people to be seen and credited as, um, um, well, humans, first of all, and as, and as those capable of um, creativity. In a similar vein, uh, Maude Queen Hare is is someone who I often reference in thinking about early pioneers, someone who really documented. She um, 
was a, a musicologist. She went to my alma mater, which is New England Conservatory, uh, lived in the neighborhood where I currently live. For those of you that are familiar with the Boston area, the area called Jamaica Plain, um, and was one who studied and, and traveled Mexico, various parts of um, the, the sort of North American continent uh, and other places to really try to document as a musicologist, try to document the um, cultural traditions, the musical traditions of Black peoples. She has a similar um, uh, sort of who's who in, in Black classical music making uh, anthology like James uh, Trotter called Negro Musicians and Their Music. Uh, of this particular book, uh, another really lauded scholar, Eileen Southern, says that this book is the first time that anyone, Black or white, has attempted to assess a body of American music that cuts across genres and styles. So with, with both of these, Maud um, Cooney here, you can also find this, not on IMSLP, but you can find this online. Both of these are just huge um, historical documents that we still have access to with names that can be studied and fleshed out, um, multiple rabbit holes for those of you that enjoy research to go down and try to learn more about um, and, and find connective points um, in, in all of these. So uh, James uh, Monroe Trotter and Maude Cooney Hare, both those that really helped document um, all of these early pioneers and people who had uh, relationships with what we consider Western classical music. I have uh, just one more, I believe, yes. Uh, and this is probably a name, perhaps, that you have come across, maybe on those classical radio stations uh, recently, or programs from um, local orchestras, or information for various articles that may be going around about um, black composers and, and sort of the who's who as it relates to African Americans specifically. So uh, William Grant Still was known as the Dean of African American Composers and really rightly so when thinking about um, the, the title of a Dean, someone who is highly regarded, some, someone who uh, has a, a great agency and authority and command, someone to look up to. He was a man of uh, many firsts including uh, the first to conduct a major U.S. orchestra in concert, and that was out west with the L.A. Phil in 1936. First um, to conduct in uh, the Deep South, first African-American to conduct in the Deep South, and that was his own piece with the New Orleans Philharmonic in 1955. First to have um, an opera produced, which was uh, Troubled Island with uh, lyrics by Langston Hughes and Verna Avey, uh, which talked about the uh, Haitian Revolution um, it was premiered in New York with the New York City Opera. Um, he was not the first African-American to uh, compose an opera, but he was the first to have it um, produced. Um, he later would write, I believe, nine operas, um, so Troubled, uh, Troubled Island all the way through uh, Highway, Highway One. Uh, the, his music lives on both from his daughter uh, Judith Ann Still and his uh, granddaughter, who, um, if, if you were to search William Grant Still, you'll, you'll find a, a website that's really controlled by uh, the William Grant Still estate, as well as all of his music, his CDs, being able to find his operas and, and really engage uh, with him. He was also the first African American to have an opera performed on national radio. Uh, and first to have a symphony performed by um, a leading orchestra, which was um, performing his Afro-American symphony, one of his probably more uh, celebrated pieces that gets uh, maybe the most airtime, certainly not his only piece, as I shared with, with opera, as well as chamber music, vocal music, etc., cetera, uh, symphonic music, but uh, one that certainly does get a lot of um, airtime. He also has some Boston-based um, connections, having uh, studied here. He, um, like other Composers typical at the time went to Oberlin, which uh, when it opens shortly after, uh, well, during Reconstruction, when it opened its doors, it admitted African American students, as did New England Conservatory and Boston Conservatory, and I believe Chicago Teachers Union. 
um, that might not be the correct name, so don't quote me on that one, but a school in, in Chicago uh, at around the 1865-1867 time period uh, opened their doors to African American students. So you see a lot of um, students, Florence Price, who we talked about last week, or last month, I should say, for our first deep, deep dive, um, has connections both to Chicago as well as to New England Conservatory. Maude Queen Hare, for instance, connections to New England Conservatory and, and many others to these schools. Um, I have a quick story to share about his probably more, more celebrated piece, the Afro-American Symphony. It was premiered in my hometown, which is Rochester, New York, with the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra and Howard Hansen conducting. Um, Howard Hansen was a, a, a big promoter, actually, of a wide variety of music, including William Grant Stills, and took this particular piece to Germany with, and conducted uh, the Berlin Philharmonic with this particular piece in the early 1900s. Um, they performed one movement. Actually, no, I'm sorry. They performed the symphony. And after listening to, to one movement, the German audience broke tradition uh, and literally would not let Howard Hansen and the orchestra continue onto the next movement until they repeated um, the, the sort of bustling city life third movement of, of his Afro-American symphony. Uh, I, I share that because it is representative of the effect that this particular um, piece, one that really infuses jazz and blues, um, Western classical, certainly symphonic traditions, uh, that is very evocative of um, sort of Harlem Renaissance kind of energy. And to hear this uh, on, on a concert stage for a first time and just be so blown away by it that you are overcome with uh, encore, 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 I think is actually re really quite amazing. So I, I share that to share a little bit about his, um, uh, how, how he was received during the time. But I want to play, and probably not all of this, uh, a piece of his called Mother and Child, which has a few different iterations. This one is for string ensemble. Um, for those that are in the Boston area, you may have heard this with a far cry, um, performed with Ty Murray, violinist as soloist. It's also uh, a, a piece for violin and piano, just very, very intimate. I've heard it performed in violin and harp, many different kinds of iterations, but one, as the name suggests, that is very intimate, um, fits within this uh, romantic and very nostalgic, uh, beautiful, hopefully, uh, you, might, you might think, uh, sound world for mother.
No good place to stop that piece, unfortunately. Uh, and I, I do hope you are able to um, finish that one on your own time and, and listen to that beautiful piece, Mother and Child by William Grant Still. Um, I, I'll also just share that as a child, um, he, similar to Samuel Coleridge Taylor, was one who very much had this omnivorous, curious nature, taught himself by mid-teens how to play my instrument viola as well as the bass and uh, piano and clarinet and a whole host of other instruments uh, and wanted very much to engage with music. His mother was worried that he would have a career and be able to support, uh, which is certainly a common narrative uh, that we hear in, in modern times uh, and wanted him to go into medicine. But uh, fortunately for us, he, he decided not to do that and instead went to Oberlin um, to study composition and create beautiful pieces like Mother and Child. Um, we only have, it seems, a, a minute left, but if there are other thoughts, we'd love to hear in the chat or feel free to come off mute and, and share. Uh, otherwise, I think we'll be back next month. And Helen, you can help me with the date for that for um, a deep dive in African-American spirituals.